This guest lecture was recorded as part of the CTRL Network's Cape on Quarantine series. For more information, including resources, please check ctrlnetwork.co.uk. Uh, Matt and, um, and his guest lecture in this series. So Matt is a profound writer who engages with Fisher's work in his recent book, Egress, um, dealing, with question, dealing with those questions of communality that we are, we are so interested in. Some of you may have been here when we introduced the work last week. Uh, if not, don't worry, I, I'm sure that, that Matt's talk will kind of um, accommodate for that. Um, and written in the aftermath of uh, Fisher's tragic death in 2017, Matt's book, in his words, deploys the cold rationalism of grief in order to escape its bounds. This is also a cold rationalism, rationalism that finds its deployment on much of his blog, uh, Xenogothic, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, this is where Matt kind of follows a personal impulse into the theoretical. Um, and on his blog, uh, Matt frequently puts theory into dialogue with the popular culture that surrounds him. And so he creates a kind of a popular theory that speaks as much to how we grapple with our desires as to our political will. Um, that much of Matt's work, uh, sorry, that much of Matt's work situates itself outside of the institution, as Fisher's did before him, is resonant with the concerns of this series, um, which attempts to level these spaces to place Fisher's work wholly in the realm of popular cultural discourse. Perhaps Matt's lecture then will speak to this moment as one of a psych of psychedelic bliss, realizing yet unfound sites of desire through which we might be able to push towards previously unimaginable political possibilities. And that's what we're eager to find out today. Uh, so Matt, uh, whenever you're ready, uh, feel free to get started. Great. Um, yeah, thanks Mal, it's such a lovely introduction. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for joining so far. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, uh, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, actually share with you a bit of a work in progress, um, which uh, sit, falls somewhere, I think, yeah, hopefully falls somewhere between what Nile was just describing. Um, as a sort of unofficial announcement, um, hopefully in a couple of months' time, Repeat is going to be putting out transcriptions that I've been working on well, and even mention an egress, um, so kind of on and off for a couple of years now, of Mark's final lectures at Goldsmiths before he died. Uh, five sessions that explore his post-capitalist desire um, and a sort of way of, his way of workshopping uh, acid communism. Um, and so what I've been trying to do is not only transcribe his lectures, but also write a bit of an introduction to them. Um, because this is Mark, it's Mark in his moment, in, in his, in his, well, in a, I was going to say in his prime, but not, it's Mark in a very specific context that a lot of people might not be so familiar with, but which was also, I think, part of what made him such an interesting writer and speaker, which is as a teacher, his, his place in the classroom. But um, I think as Mark, as, as, uh, as Nar was saying, it's, it's quite, the way that Fisher sort of fell between different, uh, ways of working in different sort of zones of thought and ways of presenting that thought. Um, it's intriguing that in these sessions, Mark's talking uh, to his students in a way that you can imagine he was talking to his students when he was writing Capitalist Realism, um, as if to say that this acid communism was perhaps going to be the, an update on that book that was similarly addressed, maybe to that same generation almost. If, uh, if acid communism was sort of addressed to sort of a further education college, kids that were sort of 18 years old in 2008, uh, in a way that it's, uh, that, that, that what's happened since then, as Collins and kind of addresses that too. Um, so I'm going to uh, read um, something I've been working on that ties together what Mark was teaching at the end of his life to um, basically, well, at the, at the great, the, 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 the general, um, uh, reach of his work. Um, so I'll recap my abstract and I'll jump into it. So in the months before his death in late 2016, Mark Fisher had returned to that most fundamental political question in the 21st century. Do we really want what we say we want? 
beginning a new postgraduate module at Goldsmiths University of London entitled Postcapitalist Desire, Fisher explored the convoluted relationship between desire and capitalism, all the while wondering what new forms of desire we might still be able to excavate from this relation, whether from the past, our present, or the not so distant future. From the emergence and failure of the counterculture in the 1970s to the continued development of his left accelerationist line of thinking, this train of thought was tragically interrupted. Nevertheless, this course was an attempt to think through and enact one of Fisher's more implicit overarching concerns, the raising of a new kind of consciousness. He, was also, con he also considered the cultural and political implications of doing so. For Fisher, this process of consciousness raising was always fundamentally psychedelic, just not in the way that we might think. This lecture will attempt to excavate this trajectory, not only as it was first articulated, not only as it was articulated in the final months of Fisher's life, but also from within the depths of his written output, stretching from the early days of the K-Punk Blanc to his final book, The Weird and the Eerie, and a few posthumous writings that have followed. In the introduction to his unfinished book, Acid Communism, the late Mark Fisher, famous for his love of post-punk jungle and a range of contemporary pop experimentalists, surprised friends and fans alike by writing positively about the counterculture of the 1960s and the 1970s. Fisher had previously been scathing about the legacy of the counterculture. He had once declared on his K-punk blog, for instance, that hippie was fundamentally a middle-class male phenomenon defined by a hedonic infantilism. The hippie's enduring, uh, the, the hippie's uh, characteristic sloppiness, ill-fitting clothes, unkempt appearance, and fuzzed out psychedelic drug, fascist drug talk displayed a disdain for sensuality, he wrote. For Mark Fisher, there was no greater crime. The hippies were guilty of passively and mindlessly giving into a depoliticized pleasure principle with the price of such happiness, a state of cored out cheery pod people effectlessness being the sacrifice of all autonomy. As far as Fisher was concerned, to self-induce a stoned stupor, chemically or otherwise, was to do capitalism's work for it, as if driven by a Freudian repetition compulsion to artificially implement capitalism's cognitive capture from within, demonstrating what he called the human organism's marked tendency to seek out and identify itself with parasites that de de debilitate but never quite destroy it. On his K-Punk blog most explicitly, Fisher offered another path, a philosophically and politically active path. This path didn't require the superficial primitivism of showering less and smoking more, nor was this akin to a new age over-reliance on positive but hollow affirmations. If we were to take our psychedelic dream of emancipation seriously, and if it is to have any contemporary relevance whatsoever, we have to realize that nothing can be achieved through getting off your head on drugs. This was not a moral point, however, but an acutely political one. The point was instead to get out through your head through the application of a psychedelic reason, auto-affecting your brain into a state of ecstasy. Fisher furnished this alternative with the 17th century philosophy of Baruch Spinoza, where his psychedelic reason lies in wait, ready to be uncovered. Spinoza is the prince of philosophers, really the only one you need, he writes. Before Deleuze and Guattari, Freud and Lacan, it was Spinoza who held the key to exercising that parasitic demon of modernity, the capitalist ego, from one's mind. Fisher notes that Spinoza took for granted what would later become the first principle of Marx's thought, that it is more important to change the world than to interpret it, constructing a reflexive ethical project that was effectively psychoanalysis 300 years early. Fisher continues, quote, Vernacular psychology has it that emotions are irreducibly mysterious, too fuzzy and indistinct to analyze beyond a certain point. Spinoza, on the other hand, maintains that happiness is a matter of emotional engineering, a precise science which can be learned and practiced. In tune with popular wisdom, Spinoza is clear that what brings well-being to one entity will poison another. The first and most override, overriding drive of any entity, Spinoza says, is its will to persist in its own being. When an entity starts to act against its own best interests to destroy itself, 
as sadly Spinoza observes humans are wont to do, it has been taken over by external forces. To be free and happy entails exercising those invaders and acting in accordance with reason, end quote. In this sense, Fisher's blogospheric rallying cry was to argue that we already possess everything that we need to escape the confines of capitalist realism, that ideological scaffolding that keeps us compliant and unimaginative, the external invader constricting mind, body, and being today. Drugs like acid and ecstasy may loosen up the mind to a certain degree, but they neglect the other more existential parts of human subjectivity, leaving them to rot and atrophy. In this sense, the problem with drugs, Fisher argues, is that they are like an escape kit without an instruction manual. Taking MDMA, he writes, is like improving Microsoft Windows. No matter how much tinkering dollar Bill Gates does, MS Windows will always be shit because it is built on top of the rickety structure of DOS. The drugs then are all too temporary. Using ecstasy, he writes, will always fuck up in the end because human OS has not been taken out and dismantled. As fun as they may be in the grand scheme of things, as fun as they may be in the grand scheme of things, and as this old song goes, the drugs don't work, they just make things worse. However, when the hippies arose from their supine head and no haze to assume power, Fisher continues, addressing the aesthetic ubiquity and cultural power of the counterculture that has lingered long past the movement's political usefulness, they brought their contempt for sensuality with them. Culturally speaking, the, the shadow of this moment is long. With the new sensuality of post-punk eventually defeated, Fisher connects the, virul the virulence of this anti-sensual sensibility to the cultural yuppies of the 1990s, epitomized by the young British artists alongside the adjacent rise to power of the laddishness of Britpop. It's hard to deny the prevalence of the counterculture's negative trajectory when framed in this way. Although at first it seems like there's little more than a similar taste in circular sunglasses to connect the Beatles' John Lennon to the Oasis's Liam Gallagher, for instance, the counterculture's cul-de-sac of passivity, or as Fisher puts it, it's hey man, it's all about the mind sensibility, was as much the driving force behind the bleary blurry, beery leery leary vibe of Britpop hedonism as it was for the acid tests of the bohemian unwashed. This is apparent as soon as you cast an eye over the acid mundanity captured in two songs like the Beatles' Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds from 1967 to Oasis's Champagne Supernova from 1995. 30 years apart from two politically distinct worlds, the bond of a psychedelic melancholy nonetheless binds them together. The same hauntological quality can be seen in John Lennon and Yoko Ono's 1969 performative sit-in, Beddings for Peace, the rotten husk of which re-emerged with the mortuary-esque white cube within the, re-emerged from within the mortuary-esque white cube of the Tate Gallery in the form of Tracy Emin's 1998 work, My Bed. This superficial regurgitation of 60s, of 60s tastes under 90s capitalism resembles a fin-de-sequel decadence of the previous century, a nightmarish and fumbling autopsy of a long-dead dream, albeit devoid of any modernist self-awareness. Britpop, in this sense, was truly an atrocity exhibition, curating a fashion show procession of neoliberal spectres still to come. It's fair to say that nothing from this period of Fisher's blogging days, a particularly productive August in 2004, constitutes putting it lightly. His critiques are barbed and often wholly negative. So how did this Mark Fisher transform into the Fisher of acid communism? Despite this unflattering appraisal from the mid 2000s, it seemed that Fisher later softened his opinion on the counterculture as a whole. And yet despite appearances, this transformation was not so extreme. Fisher instead took it upon himself to move beyond his barbed critiques and towards the construction of a positive political project, a project that still had this Spinozist psychedelic reason at its heart. It seems that in the process of constructing such a project, Fisher had begun to newly appreciate the, politi the, the political potentials of the counterculture's best cultural and aesthetic offerings, at least in their original socio-political context. 
These potentials were not to be found in the surrealist abstractions of a bourgeois Pink Floyd concert, repurposed nostalgically and apolitically for today. Instead, they were to be found explicitly in the aborted cultural artifacts that built new bridges between class consciousness and psychedelic consciousness, between class consciousness and group consciousness, but which were smothered or abandoned before their time. For instance, in the introduction to acid communism, Fisher champions the, the, the Kinks' Sunny Afternoon and the Beatles' I'm Only Sleeping, as two tracks both released in 1966 that were able to apprehend, quote, the anxiety dream toil of everyday life from a perspective that floated alongside, above, or beyond it, whether it was the busy street glimpse from the high window of a late sleeper whose bed becomes a gently idling rowing boat, the fog and frost of a Monday morning of George from a Sunday, sunny Sunday afternoon that does not need to end, or the urgencies of business airily disdained from the eerie of a meandering aristocratic pile now occupied by working class dreamers who will never clock on again. End quote. There is more to this political provocation than the average BBC Radio 4 listener's dream of a quiet Sunday that never ends. More generally, Fisher was interested, and had always been interested, in the ways that radical political messages can be smuggled into the collective consciousness through popular culture. He was also intrigued by the ways that pop culture could not only entice us with its infectious euphoria, but also push past capitalism's co-option of the pleasure principle into something deeper, something altogether unconscious, and bring it kicking and screaming to the surface. A number of questions nonetheless remain. Most importantly, Marx, Mark sought to ask where these potentials went and why. It was obvious that, as he would later put it, the establishment feared nothing more than the working class becoming hippies. But why was this? What was it that threatened the establishment so much that a burgeoning neoliberalism saw it as necessary to implement a hostile takeover of a new collective consciousness? And might the renewed manifestation of some of these thwarted potentials lying in stasis still threaten the capitalist realist establishment today? These questions constitute a view of psychedelia that still needs to be affirmed. It is the dormant function of psychedelia in this sense, rather than its familiar aesthetic form that remains relevant to us in the present moment. The way the word itself, all aesthetic associations aside, connotes the manifestation of what is deep within the mind, not simply on its surface. Etymologically rooted in the irregular conjunction of the English word psyche and the Greek word delos, meaning manifest or reveal, the psychedelic is that which manifests what is in the mind, echoing Karl Marx's Spinoza's adage once again, his call for a dialectical materialism that insisted we must not settle for interpreting the world, but instead striving to change it. This is not to set interpretation and manifestation in opposition, however, rather the former must always strive to become the latter. A new psychedelic culture is required then that will inform politics anew, but it may not look how we expect it to. Indeed, we should be vigilant of anything that appears too familiar. We might even argue that the aesthetic connotations of psychedelia today are to be rejected outright. As Fisher once wrote on surrealism, surely one of countercultural psychedelia's clearest antecedents, quote, like punk, surrealism is dead as soon as it is reduced to an aesthetic style. It comes unalive again when it is instantiated as a delirial program, just as punk becomes unalive when it is effectuated as an anti-authoritarian, acephalic, contagion network. This is why the counterculture should be handled with care. In spite of, or perhaps because of, its contemporary romanticization, it seems to, it's, it seems to have been the last time that a cultural revolution came close to effectuating a political one. Culture was nonetheless, has nonetheless continued to, to develop a pace, but politics has been sluggish to catch up. Nevertheless, there's still a great deal to be excited about despite the state of a, pol a contemporary political establishment. As Fisher concludes in the introduction to acid communism, of course we know that the revolution did not happen, but the material conditions for such a revolution are more in place in the 21st century than they were in 1977. Rather than simply celebrating the potentials of the counterculture, Fisher had serious questions to ask about why it failed and how we might learn from those lessons today. He continues, quote, 
What has shifted beyond all recognition since then is the existential and emotional atmosphere. Populations are resigned to the sadness of work as they are, uh, even as they are told that automation is making their jobs disappear. We must regain the optimism of that 70s moment, just as we must carefully analyze all the machineries that capitalism deployed to convert confidence into dejection. Understanding how this process of consciousness deflation worked is the first step to reversing it. The essay ends on a cliffhanger, and this call to understand the process fades away, seemingly without a roadmap. Following Fisher's death in January 2017, the assumption has been that the particulars of acid communism were lost with Fisher himself. And yet there remain plenty of breadcrumbs out in the world for the curious to consider, some of which we've already looked at. Perhaps the best thing to do is to apply Fisher's advertised strategy to his own thinking, that is understanding how this, the project of acid communism emerged is the first step to reconstructing it. Such a strategy requires a lot less speculation than one might first assume. Along with a disparate collection of essays spanning the length of his career as a writer and critic that reflect many of the themes and subjects he was expected to explore, there is also the structure of Fisher's final postgraduate module, Post-Capitalist Desire, which is devised for the academic year of 2016-2017 at Goldsmiths University of London. The dawn of the academic year 2016-2017 brought about a number of changes to the visual cultures department at Goldsmiths. This was true for everyone, but particularly Mark Fisher and Kojo Eshen. Prior to that year, the pair had co-convened a, post a postgraduate Master of Arts degree in oral and visual cultures, a course which, in short, asked the question, how do we think about the relation of sound and image in the era of ubiquitous media? However, following a number of administrative changes within the university, this course, along with a handful of other relatively small master's courses, was to be subsumed into a pre-existing and now conglomerate MA course in contemporary art theory. These changes could have been taken as a loss for Fisher and Eschen, but they instead took the opportunity to try something new, leaving behind the focus of oral and visual cultures to develop two separate modules that reflected their present interests. While Eschen devised the Geopoetic Seminar, a 15-week, very close reading of Reza Negrostani's notoriously difficult 2008 work of theory fiction, Psychonopedia, Fisher began Post-Capitalist Desire, a seminar in which he would explore the nefarious and entangled relationship between desire and capitalism, and the extent to which the former can both help and restrict us in our attempts to escape from the latter. It could also be seen as an attempt to workshop his next book, the now familiar work in progress given the tentative title of Acid Communism. The course took its name from an essay Fisher had previously published in 2012 exploring the relation of desire to politics in a post-Fordist context. Taking seriously a much ridiculed comment made by the conservative politician Louise Mensch on British television about the apparent hypocrisy of Occupy protests in 2010, who uh, protesters who decried capitalism whilst she said, standing in line at Starbucks, tweeting about the protests from their iPhones, Fisher argued that Mensch's argument nevertheless warrants a serious response. This was to say that whilst Mensch's cynicism was superficial, um, are the implications of her critique not still deeply troubling? Considering her asinine observation, might we not still ask ourselves to what extent our desire for post-capitalism is always already captured and neutralized by capitalism itself? How, how are we supposed to combat the intensification of desire for consumer goods funded by credit? Should we even try? For Fisher, the response cannot be, as Mensch suggests, a reactionary striving for a pre-capitalist primitivism. The libidinal attractions of consumer capitalism, he suggests, need to be met with a counter-libido, not simply an anti-libidinal dampening. Fisher goes on to demonstrate this need for a counter-libido through a close engagement with the anti-Marxist -anti writings of his controversial former lecturer, Nick Land. In particular, Land's essay, Machinic Desire. Here, Land argues in his quintessential 90s cyberpunk mode for a kind of becoming replicant, 
are becoming imminent with the forces of capitalism. For land, it is no longer possible, quote, uh, it is no longer plausible, sorry, that the relation between capital and desire is either external or supported by imminent contradiction, even if a few comical ascetics continue to assert that libidinal involvement with the commodity can be transcended by critical reason. Which I always find that quote quite striking that despite Land's utter dismissal of what Fisher goes on to write about, Fisher nonetheless takes him to task in asserting that critical reason again in relation to desire. So here, capitalism is not an essence, but a tendency, like the Lacanian death drive that asserts the innate nihilism of human existence to be a striving to return to the pre-Oedipal calm of the womb. Land argues that capitalism persists today because cyberspace is already under our skin. As such, to attempt to separate our desires from capitalism is to stick a chest spreader in the still kicking subject of modernity. For Fisher, as nightmarish as the modern left may find Land's appraisals, they would also be remiss to ignore them. The ways in which we can counter or ethically account for these critiques by implementing a counter libido to, to capitalist desire, a post-capitalist desire, was to be the driving force behind Fisher's module. In the first week, he renewed this line of questioning, beginning once again with Mensch's provocation, whilst also addressing some of his responses still unresolved tensions. However, before he and his students could look to a counter-libidinal future, just as he has forewarned his readers in the Acid Communism intro, it was necessary that they first ascertained why any previous counter-libido had failed to effectuate, effectuate and materialize real societal change. The first few weeks of the course attempted to do answer these questions through a variety of readings, from the densely theoretical to the pop historical. In week two, for instance, addressing the perhaps surprising influence of Freudian psychoanalysis on the emerging counterculture, Fisher takes two contrasting views of the period. One from Frankfurt School political philosopher Herbert Marcuse in 1955, the other from feminist essayist and music critic Ellen Willis in 1981. Taken together, they provide an insight into the period from a moment immediately prior to the counterculture's re-emergence, as well as a damning posthumous account of its eventual failure. It's an unnerving contrast. Marcuse's text remains as invigorating as it was over 60 years ago, but Willis's critiques also reverberate profoundly with our present. As Fisher wrote elsewhere in a 2013 essay on efflux, quote, the 60s counterculture might now have been reduced to a series of iconic, that is over familiar, endlessly circulated, dehistoricized aesthetic relics, stripped of political content. But Ellis's work stands as a painful reminder of leftist failure. As Willis makes clear in her introduction to her 1981 book, Beginning to See the Light, she frequently found herself at odds with what she experienced as the, as the authoritarianism and statism of mainstream socialism. While the music she listened to spoke of freedom, Socialism seemed to be about centralization and state control. The story of how the counterculture was co-opted by the neoliberal right is now a familiar one. But the other side of this narrative is the left's incapacity to transform itself in the face of the new forms of desire to which the counterculture gave voice." End quote. This critique can be found in other examples of Fisher's writing from around this time as well. 2013 was also the year that he published his now infamous essay, Exiting the Vampire Castle. Considering these two essays side by side, it is clear that what Willis had described from the dark side of the 1970s, Fisher saw continuing to undermine the hopes and dreams of the 21st century left. From the rift that emerged between the trade unions and the counterculture in America in the, 19, in the early 1970s, to British Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott's 1997 declaration that we're all middle class now. The latter half of the 20th century was defined, in Fisher's mind at least, by the, disartic the disarticulation of class from almost all cultural and political discourses. In the 21st century, however, class has been making a comeback. From the rise of grime to mainstream popularity in the early 2000s, to the publication of Owen Jones' 2011 book, Chavs, 
a new class consciousness was emerging in the popular culture of Great Britain, presenting itself in many different forms. Unfortunately, this class consciousness still struggled to perforate what Fisher had called a febrile McCarthyite atmosphere fermented by the moralizing left. Fisher's tone in exiting the vampire castle was one of fury and impatience, disappointment and frustration. It was, after all, an exit, but only from social media. The response to the essay, from some quarters at least, could make the more casual intercalator think that Fisher had turned his back on all that the left held dear. It could be said that this was Fisher's critique from the other side also. In disarticulating class from the identitarian struggles of the day, capitalism no longer appeared to be the enemy. We were instead prone to impotently turning on each other. At that time, this critique of the political landscape seemed to be wholly negative, populated as it was and continues to be by a vampiric, a vampiric cast of energy sucking trolls who use social media and Twitter especially to wholly deflate any emerging political group consciousness. Echoing the various descriptions of grey vampires that had peppered his K-Punk blog, comment box marauders who don't feed on energy directly, they feed on obstructing projects. Fisher deployed, de deplored the complacent identitarian milieu of social media that seemed determined to undermine the most exciting pop cultural shift in decades. Nevertheless, many rejected Fisher's appraisal outright, but it was later vindicated in the years of the Brexit referendum and Jeremy Corbyn's leader, leadership of the Labour Party, with the latter in particular constituting a potential reformation of left-wing politics in Britain that was as consistently and undermined from within as it was from without. The damage done has been substantial to class consciousness above all else. Class consciousness is fragile and fleeting, as Fisher argued, but the best and fundamental way to combat this is to retain it as a topic of conversation. He continues, the petty bourgeoisie which dominates the academy and the cultural industry has all kinds of subtle deflections and preemptions which prevent the topic ever coming up. And then, if it does come up, they make one thing it is a terrible impertinence, a breach of etiquette to raise it. This indignation is as persistent as ever. However, the very fact that class consciousness must be persistently undermined gives us a sense of its nascent polit political power. Unfortunately, for Fisher's vampire with Fisher's vampire castle going viral throughout the Anglosphere, igniting a social media outrage machine that he sought to critique, many wrote Fisher off entirely for committing the very cardinal sin he was hoping to challenge in other guises, that is separating class consciousness from and elevating it above any other consciousness of gender, race, or other minoritarian category of self-identification. The reality of his position, as he would later take great care to emphasize, was quite to the contrary. Fisher later refined the argument he made so polemically in exiting the vampire castle by transforming his negative critique into a positive project of consciousness raising. It was this same project that Fisher turned to in the third week of his post-capitalist desire seminar. Becoming popular during the second wave feminism movement of the 1960s and 70s, consciousness raising was the name given to a practice of collective discussion that highlighted the inequalities under which people collectively live. This was, this was a necessary process because as Fisher argued in his post-capitalist desire module, consciousness of one's material existence is despite itself, not immediately self-evident. It has to be given. Uh, sorry, uh, instead, of, instead, consciousness of one's own place within a structure of inequality, be that capitalism, patriarchy, or white supremacy, must be constructed, it is never given. The best way to construct such a consciousness is always with the participation of others who share a similar material existence. Writing for the political organization Plan C about the psychedelic potentials to left to be extracted from a group practice of consciousness raising, Fisher explains, quote, to have one's consciousness raised is not merely to become aware of the facts of which one was previously ignorant. It is instead to have one's whole relationship with the world shifted. The consciousness in question is not a consciousness of an already existing state of affairs. Rather, consciousness raising is productive 
it creates a new subject, a we that is both the agent of struggle and what is struggled for. At the same time, consciousness raising intervenes in the object, the world itself, which is now no longer apprehended as some static opacity, the nature of which is already decided, but as something that can be transformed. This transformation requires knowledge. It will not come about through spontaneity, voluntarism, the experiencing of ruptural events, or by virtue of marginality alone. In the present, end quote, by the way, in the present, whilst there are agents of struggle everywhere, what is struggled for is disparate and unclear. It even seems to be the case that certain modes of political consciousness seized by capitalism itself have been used precisely to fragment solidarity rather than create it. As individuals squabble over who has the most privilege on Twitter, for instance, turning on each other, the true enemy, capitalism itself, is left completely off the hook. It was Fisher's hope that these newly raised, raised and yet fragmented forms of consciousness proliferating under so-called identity politics could still find common ground that included a, particularly, uh, a previously disarticulated class consciousness. This was necessary so that the left could produce what he had once called in his 2009 book, Capitalist Realism, the required subject, a collective subject. Over the next decade, Fisher would further develop this concept of a collective subject, coming to prefer the term group consciousness. Returning to his essay for Plan C, it, is, it was here that Fisher most successfully elaborated on the need to extend the idea of consciousness beyond the individual. He writes, quote, since consciousness raising has been used by all kinds of subjugated groups, it would perhaps be better to talk of subjugated co group consciousness rather than just class consciousness. Subjugated group consciousness is first of all a consciousness of the, of the cultural, political, existential machineries that produce subjugation. The machineries which normalize the dominant group and create a sense of inferiority in the subjugated. But secondly, it is also a consciousness of the potency of the subjugated group, a potency that depends upon this very raised state of consciousness." End quote. Unfortunately, in the years that followed the bruising reception of his Exiting the Vampire Castle essay, this subjugated group consciousness kept deflating. The Corbyn era of the Labour Party at first seemed to promise a revival, but the debacle of Brexit pricked any hope of this emerging consciousness coming to dominate. Whilst Fisher did not live to see the new lows that Brexit would drag his, this consciousness into, he nonetheless continued to highlight the incursions wrought upon it prior to that moment, in the hope that, just as Owen Jones had done in 2011, shining a light on the right example at the right time might just wake, wake the nation from its stupor. In 2014, for instance, Fisher turned to the controversial documentary series Benefit Street, which followed the lives of the residents of James Turner Street in Birmingham a street that was supposedly home to more social welfare dependent households than anywhere else in Britain. Writing for New Humanist magazine, Fisher argued that the programme, by its very nature, implied a default bourgeois gaze, which judges working class participants as, as lacking by comparison to them with the middle class. Moreover, Fisher continues, this lack is understood in heavily moralised terms. It isn't to be explained by the working class's lack of resources or opportunities, but by a, def a deficit will in a deficit in will and efforts. In this sense, Benefit Street was a program that portrayed an even more pernicious mutation within the ever-evolving nature of capitalist realism. Not only was capitalism deemed to, by the realists to be the only game in town, the gaze of its central phantasmatic subject, the evergreen middle class was now taken to be the default subject position available as well. Whereas Fisher may have rejected the 90s announcement that we are all middle class now, our television screens announced this reality silently and without fanfare. The message, though implicit, was familiar. There is no alternative. As a side note, I don't know if anyone's been watching the new series of Queer Eye, <laughs> um, but that's, I think that's another program that shows a, a new mutation of that same point. Um, that this the 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 five the five gays of, of queer eye don't moralize to the same extent that uh something like benefit street does 
but nevertheless have like a they 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 try to um, uh, um, um, uh, export onto their um, the people that they're helping a default bourgeois gaze. So the enforcement of a, the middle class as a default subjective position would be the topic covered by Fisher in his final post-capitalist desire lecture before the Christmas break. Here, the fact the middle that the fact that the working class might possibly find enjoyment in their own oppression becomes a challenge as darkly humorous as it is viscerally disenchanting. Here again, the challenges put forth by Fisher's former lecturer Nick Land echo ominously. Reading aloud from Jean Francois Lyotard's viciously difficult 1974 book, The Biddenal Economy, Fisher relishes the work's most polemic passages. As Leotard seems to prophesy, the patronizing gaze cast upon James Turner Street, putting the producers on blast, who dare not say the only important thing there is to say, that one can enjoy swallowing the shit of capital, its materials, its metal bars, its polystyrene, its books, its sausage pâtés, swallowing tons of it till you burst. As far as Leotard is concerned, the English unemployed did not become workers to survive. They hang on tight and spit on me enjoyed the hysterical, masochistic, whatever exhaustion it was of hanging on in the mines, in the foundries, in the factories, in hell. They enjoyed it, enjoyed the mad destruction of their organic body, which was indeed imposed upon them. They enjoyed the decomposition of their personal identity, the identity that the peasant tradition had constructed for them, enjoyed the dissolution of their families and villages, and enjoyed the new monstrous anonymity of the suburbs and the pubs in the morning and evening. Fisher had long taken Leotard's charge, his, dark, his stark description of a crisis of negation and political negativity, in all of its dark humour, deeply seriously. In his 2010 essay, Terminator versus Avatar, for instance, Fisher updates Leotard's provocation for the 21st century. He writes, hands up who wants to give up, hands up who wants to give up their anonymous suburbs and pubs and return to the organic mud of the peasantry. Hands up, that is to say, all those who really want to return to pre-capitalist territorialities, families and villages. Hands up, furthermore, those who really believe that these desires for a restored organic wholeness are extrinsic to late capitalist culture, rather than fully incorporated components of the capitalist libidinal infrastructure. The working class of, of the 21st century are as entangled in their subordinated desire slash desire for subordination as they are as they were in the 20th but this paradox this feedback loop is not without its uses as fisher continues not far beneath leotard's desire drunk yes lies the no of hatred anger and frustration no satisfaction no fun no future these are the resources of negativity that i believe the left must make contact with again the left at large may not be ready for this at present and Fisher himself may have softened in his lust for negativity. But just as the developing counterculture repeatedly foreshadowed the political sea changes of the era, Leotard's provocations find themselves encapsulated in much contemporary music and culture. Indeed, what is a counterculture, if not a cultural hegemony recast in negative? Whilst there are many examples to choose from in our present moment, this fire may find itself most find its most obvious spiritual successor in the Sleaford Mods, whose music oozes a, oozes a fury in which economic and sexual frustration coalesce in a manner that Leotard first controversially put to work in his deeply transgressive theory of libidinal economy. On their 2008 track Job Seeker, for instance, vocalist Jason Williamson hangs on tight and spits on you through the speakers, rehearsing a kind of spiteful inner monologue what he wishes he could say to the superficially sympathetic bureaucrats at the job center. So, Mr. Williamson, what have you done to find gainful employment since your last signing on date? Fuck all. I've been sat around the house wanking. And I don't know why you don't serve coffee here. My signing on time is supposed to be 10 past 11. It's now 12 o'clock. And some of you smelly bastards need executing. Mr. Williamson, your employment history looks quite impressive. I'm looking at three managerial positions you previously held with quite rep reputable companies. Isn't this something you'd like to get back to? Nah, I just end up robbing the fucking place. You've got a till full of 20 staring at you all day, 
I'm hardly not going to bank it. Job seeker, the job seeker, rejects the moralized figure of the downtrodden and out of luck. It is the inverse of a figure like Daniel Blake, as seen in Ken Loach's critically acclaimed 2016 film, I, Daniel Blake. Rather than raising consciousness through sympathy, depicting through a fiction, the abject reality of the British welfare state, Williamson instead raises consciousness through bloody mindedness, bottling the shame of class subordination, and weaponizing it. This is not to say the Sleaford mod's re rejection of a Ken Loach image is a negation of that form of political consciousness. It simply offers another image of proletarian subjectivity, ejected from the system and loving it. Job Seeker then reinvigorates Leotard's desire drunk yes, affirming the fact that this uneasy subjugation is what makes the working class a threat to the system of itself. Fuck your middle class propriety, I've got desires to pursue. Fisher's psychedelic reason still has a role to play here. The implication is that the stay in bed float upstream anti-work ethic of the Beatles in the 1960s is more within reach for the working class now than ever before. What was good enough for John and Yoko is certainly good enough for Williamson and his collaborator, Andrew Fern. Isn't it better that it takes place in a flat in Grantham than a private suite at the Hilton Hotel? Reflecting on the present accessibility of this potent affectivity in a review of two Sleaford Mods releases for The Wire magazine in 2014, Fisher writes that the sort of discontent Williamson gives voice to is everywhere in the UK now, but for the most part it's privatised, blunted by alcohol and antidepressants, or directed into impotent comic box spite and empty social media outrage. But it is nonetheless underscored by a class consciousness painfully aware that there is nothing which could not transform disaffection into political action. Many questions remain. Fisher asks, who will make contact with the anger and frustration that Williamson articulates? Who can convert this bad affect into a new political project? That is, who will, who will seize this chemically blunted disaffection and let it loose on the establishment? At the time of writing, there may be no more subtle, move, suitable movement than that of, the black, of black Lives Matter. This dis disaffection is powerful, but its primary goal is surely to be kindling to a wider movement. Could it be doomed to impotence if the fire doesn't catch on the imagination of demographics beyond that which it gives voice to? Speaking about Leotard with the students in, 20, in late 2016, Fisher similarly admires, uh, ad, uh, similarly admires the philosopher's glorious hemmed in quality but wonders if Leotard's barbed rant is a display of the glorious kind of autonomy and sufficiency of the text itself, or its impotence, impotence or uselessness. This is not a question for the Black Lives Matter movement, but is a, it is a question that continues to haunt our wider countercultures at large today. And if that haunts culture, it inevitably haunts politics. Unless the strengths of the latter emerge from the former, we may find ourselves stuck in the same feedback loop that we have long languished in. Fisher's post-capitalist desire module, much like the introduction to, to his asset communism, presents this as an attempt to root around this capture. It asks, what is required of us if we truly want to accelerate beyond the pleasure principle, to push beyond capitalism? No, I've mixed it up there. It asks, what is required of us if we, if we truly want to push beyond capitalism? The suggestion that emerges from Leotard in week five is that we must accelerate beyond the pleasure principle, beyond our culture of retrospection and pastiche, beyond the persistent disarticulation of group consciousness, beyond capitalist realism. In this sense, Fisher is attempting to describe to his students from the ground up a new praxis for a left accelerationism that manages to finally escape the tandem impotence of dialectical materialism, of negation and affirmation. Accelerationism is mentioned frequently throughout the seminar, even in the rest of Fisher's works. But Fisher, and Fisher makes clear he, uh, and Fisher even goes so far as to say that the, the, that the discourse surrounding accelerationism was the biggest influence on his course at the time. And we might extend that to say it was the biggest influence for us in communism. However, from the vantage point of 2020, its frequent appearances in Fisher's thought warrants some further context. Accelerationism is much to malign today, having garnered a perhaps fatal popular association with the far right with the term most repulsively appearing in the manifesto of Australian mass murderer Brendan Tarrant 
who killed and injured almost 100 people in Christchurch, New Zealand in 2019. The popular understanding of this philosophy's aims today is that capitalism, or the status quo more generally, is some barely functioning, unsustainable mess of contradictions. Therefore, we should accelerate the mechanisms of capitalism, or the status quo, towards their inevitable dream, uh, inevitable doom. I think that's a point worth making that the right, the far right version of accelerationism disarticulates capitalism completely from its aims. It focuses on the status quo, whatever that is, um, in particular. This position is even more loosely but frequently translated as things have to get worse before they can get better. And yet, as the philosopher Pete Wolfendale noted in 2015, responding to a review of Urbanomics publication, Accelerate, the Accelerationist Reader, this is, not a, this is not a position that anyone has ever held. Accelerationism, a slick dismissal coined by Benjamin Noyes in his 2010 critique of post-May 68 continental philosophy, the persistence of the negative, was later seized upon by Mark Fisher and paradoxically affirmed. Noyes' book was by and large a critique of how continental philosophy was obsessed with affirming the negative. Fisher, in deftly trollish fashion, then affirmed Noyes' negative critique. In hindsight, this may have been a mistake on Fisher's part, but for better or for worse, the name stuck. Fisher did this arguably to demonstrate that Noyes' position as being somehow above this, this entanglement of negations and affirmations was a fallacy. In late capitalist society, we affirm negations and negate affirmations every day. This cycle is in part what Fisher saw as leading to the hauntological stuckness of the 21st century. Accelerationism then, as hauntology's hyperactive cousin, was seen by Fisher and others as an analysis of the ever-increasing speed of technological progression under capitalism and how this was affecting human cultural production. These issues are still uh, pertinent today. Ooh. Uh, I've lost my way. Um, the continental philosophers that Noyes cast scorn upon may have not been as successful in their endeavours of um, affirming the negative, but to denounce them in Fisher's, uh, for Fisher, to denounce them for all this was, is useless. Few have gotten so close, philosophically speaking, um, at least, to wrestling us from our stupor of indoctrination. Nevertheless, it is from Noyes' arguably super superficial initial argument that most critiques of accelerations are now emerge. This is to say that Noyes did in fact designate the theory under his critical eye as harboring the belief that if capitalism generates its own forces of dissolution, then the, the, necess then, then the necessity is to radicalize capitalism itself, the worse the better. It was this that he referred to as continental philosophy's accelerationist tendency. What Wolfendale does implicitly when claiming no one has ever held this position is apply this critique both to the present accelerationist, accelerationist blogosphere he is writing in and retrospectively to the figures Noyes is misreading. As Wolfendale continues, accelerationism is not about accelerating the contradictions of, of capitalism in any sense. Whatever is being accelerated, and there are severe and significant disagreements about this, it is not contradictions. And when, whatever transition this acceleration aims towards, it is not societal collapse. This concerns Leotard in particular, a figure who looms large in both Noyes' critique and Fisher's affirmation. As Wolfendale explains, mapping out some of accelerationism's central philosophical antecedents, Leotard included, his attempt to combine Marxism and psychoanalysis has many problems, but it does problematize the, the notions of desire and alienation in, in important ways. What Leotard argues, anticipating Louise, Men Louise, Louise Mensch's cynical critique by over 30 years, is that there is no pure, authentic, or natural pre-capitalist form of life to return to. And so we must not disavow the forms of living and desire that have been produced under capitalism, simply because of this fact, simply because of this fact of their genesis. However, where we go from here remains a lively field of de for debate. What the nature, what the, what the nature of a post-capitalist desire uh, will be remains to be seen. Wolfendale writes that our speculation on this matter can descend into a perverse celebration of capitalism's destructive and oppressive tendencies, I'm looking at you, Leotard, or it can equally become a call for greater self-consciousness regarding how we construct our desires and ourselves. He is looking at you, Foucault. 
an honest appraisal that refuses to be trapped within the nostalgic false consciousness that seeps unbidden into so much, so much leftist discourse. Here, Fisher's psychedelic reason once again rears its head. And accelerationism, as an admittedly broad church, contends precisely with the ways that a reason under siege from the, irreal the irreality of capitalist modernity can still give rise, as Spinoza declared, to actually existing human freedom. Unfortunately, the promise of this line of thought further developed, uh, this thought's further development was tragically interrupted. Following the Christmas break of 2016, Fisher's seminar did not resume. As a result, his final lecture on leotard is bittersweet. Little seems resolved, but following our engagement with these five sessions alone, we may nonetheless find ourselves in possession of a new knowledge regarding the circumstances in which we live and in many ways have always lived. Since Fisher's death, the same sentiment has been expressed online over and over again. I wish Mark Fisher was here to inform, to provide insight, to give us hope, to give us a laugh. But in each instance, it is clear that the questions Fisher asked of Leotard and the Sleaford Mods remain pertinent to his own project in the aftermath of his death. Who will make contact with the anger and frustration he articulated? In addition, who will make contact with the joy and energy he created as well? For many students and staff who were attending Goldsmiths at the time of Fisher's death, there was an intense desire to take up its discordance immediately, as many borrowed Fisher's own words to reject the sudden horror that had descended upon the university campus that first Monday morning, two days after his death. Each of the five post-capitalist desire seminars had taken place on a Monday morning. The sixth session of Fisher's module never took place, but after the news of his death spread throughout the university, uh, many students, um, many students, lost my way, many students chose to attend, uh, chose to attend it anyway. A class of 20 doubled, perhaps trebled in size, as faces familiar, un unfamiliar, from both undergraduate and postgraduate degrees, gathered together on an, on an objectively miserable Monday morning, waiting for Fisher himself to walk through the door and reveal his hoax. After some time spent in silence, an impromptu listening session began instead. Although it was likely just an arbitrary instance of, of administrative scheduling, it is hard not to imbue the timing of Fisher's lectures with some deeper significance. The penultimate post on his famous K-Punk blog before it fell silent forever had presented an audio mix fittingly entitled No More Miserable Monday Mornings, a title that would also find itself repurposed within his acid communism intro. It was a phrase that recast, that recast in a new and hopeful context that old adage, you don't hate Mondays, you hate your job. In the immediate context of Fisher's life, it took on a double meaning, as both a call to the end of work, as a, both a call for the end of work and a sly Leotardian acknowledgement that he loved working with his students, who likewise loved working with him. With this final, with this understanding in mind, it was this mix that his students chose to listen to on that mournful Monday morning in mid-January. The mix starts appropriately with Sleaford Mod's job, job seeker before passing through the rise and fall of the counterculture. Psychedelic pop gives way to dub, which gives way to disco. The pressure cooker of 21st century working class fury finds itself harnessed and redirected until the mix fades out to Sheik's blissful 1978 track, At Last I Am Free. The mix is a tonic and a mode of consciousness raising present, presented chrono chronologically in reverse, where the political fury of today re-establishes contact with the cultural joy of the counterculture. But this mix is not a nostalgic longing for a lost moment. It simply takes advantage of the fact that these songs, these cultural artifacts, still exist and are still at our disposal, much like the potentials they represent. In this sense, it is a mix that emphasizes the political function of each track over its aesthetic form. Taken as a whole, it auto affects the brain into a state of joyful indignation reigniting an aesthetic moment long since reified into an all too timely collection of genres. Despite this process of aesthetic reification, the freedom it promises nonetheless remains soul soulful 
and the emboldened soul rattles the subjugated body out of its contemporary complacency. It is a mix that may slide from 2008 to 1978, but the message nonetheless remains future orientated. There are alternatives and there are tomorrows. There is a world to be transformed. The stakes of this overall argument could not be more apparent in our present moment. Over the weekend, I'm sure many of you saw the amazing footage in which protesters tore down a statue of Edward Colston in Bristol, rolled him through the streets and dumped him in the harbour. There is no better encapsulation of collective joy erupting from the fury of protest. The last time I came close to witnessing something like this, it was following Mark's death in London clubs or at Notting Hill Carnival after Grenfell. It is difficult to articulate how much fun we had mourning him and others. My book Egress was a product of trying to wrestle with that feeling of finding a strange pleasure in the grief and of how that was all mixed up with a paradoxical defiance of guilt. I've been wrestling with the book again of late, an unavoidable process for something so embedded in time that I'm always moving away from. But those videos over the weekend helped me to affirm this position again and even see beyond it. We shall see in the coming days, I'm sure, the various ways that the state and the media will struggle to comprehend this similar, this similar sort of gray area in which the Black Lives, Matters, the Black Lives Matter protests exist. That strange place between sadness and joy, between riot and protest, between grief and celebration, wake and party. Already, Keir Starmer today demonstrated how liberalism cannot compute such a gesture, saying that the destruction of the Colston statue was uh, the wrong right thing to do. The right thing to do is seemingly to bureaucrat the bureaucratize debate, but in that way, nothing changes as the arguments over Colston's statue have demonstrated for the last 30 years. The perversion of the negative is sometimes necessary. And in the second wave of the Black Lives Matter movement, we may be witnessing one of those rare moments, arguably unseen for decades, where a protest movement shows a way out of our postmodern crisis of the negative, in which negative acts finally bring about positive change. Thanks. <laughs>